This audio presentation of the Essene Jesus, a reevaluation from the Dead Sea Scrolls by Edmund Bordeaux Sicelli, is brought to you by AudioEnlightenment.com. Copyright 2014. All rights reserved. The Teachers of Humanity. A lecture delivered in 1940 at the Essene School, La Puerta, Baja, California. Just as the life of the ocean is not governed by the waves on its surface, but by the powerful undercurrents deep below which rise great mountains of water on the sea, so the history of mankind is not its lines of kings and princes or the rise and fall of empires, but a succession of great revelations to humanity. According to the Essene tradition, the earliest teacher of humanity known to us was Enoch, the founder of the Essene Brotherhood who taught how to unite the thinking body of man with the cosmic ocean of thought, infinite and eternal. Next came the Sumerian Zarathustra, with his teaching of Asha, the cosmic order. After him, Moses brought down from the mountain of Sinai the tablets containing the Essene communions with the angels. Another link in a succession was the teaching of Buddha, who in India set in motion the cosmic wheel of life. Finally, there was the Essene Brotherhood of the Dead Sea, which planted the Essene Tree of Life, whose highest branch was represented by the Essene Jesus, latest and therefore closest to us of all the great teachers of humanity. The quintessence of his revelation is found in the Sermon on the Mount. Why is it necessary that every few thousand years a great teacher should come to mankind? Is it that the teaching of his predecessors were not complete or were insufficient? Were the earlier teachers greater than those that came after, or was the reverse the case? For an understanding of the essence of the Sermon on the Mount and the role of Jesus the Essene, these questions and their attendant problems require to be answered. According to the Essene traditions, each of the great teachers of humanity revealed the whole truth in a complete, all-sided and absolute revelation. Since the laws of life and of the universe have been, are, and always will be the same, in the Essene view, the revelation of each teacher has two aspects, an inner or esoteric aspect and an outer or exoteric. The value and extent of the revelation of a great teacher is not limited by him with his infinite knowledge, but is limited by the ability of his disciples and of the multitudes to understand his teaching. In all ages, the great teachers have given a complete revelation of the whole all-sided truth concerning the laws of life and of the universe to a group of disciples representing the minority whose individual evolution had reached the point where they were able to understand their master's teaching in its entirety. The same holds true today, when there is still only a minority capable of understanding the all-sided truth. For this reason, each great teacher revealed an esoteric revelation which is absolute, all-sided, unlimited, as well as an exoteric teaching adapted to the degree of understanding of the multitude of his age. The latter, easily comprehensible to the masses, in each case became the thought of millions among whom it was propagated, though in extending the truth some of the depth of the revolution, revelation had necessarily to be sacrificed. The greatness of each teacher lay in his ability to reveal exactly what the multitude needed and could understand and follow. The adaptation of a great universal teaching to a particular age is a task of the first magnitude. As regards to their esoteric teaching, the geniuses of the great teachers of mankind was their ability to choose from the multitude those few who had the necessary degree of individual evolution for the understanding, living in practice of the revelations made to them. The essence of the Sermon on the Mount is contained in its first nine verses two of which are introductory, while the remainder consists of seven declarations, the Beatitudes, beginning with the words, Blessed are. These verses will be considered from the universal standpoint outlined in the preceding section, and the discussion of them will be based on two texts, the Gospel according to St. Matthew, verses 1-9, through 9, which has been officially adapted by the churches, and the Essene Gospel of Peace, which was treated as apocryphal by the early synods. The seven Beatitudes, and seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, verse 1 through 2. These two verses are usually regarded as an unessential introduction to the verses that follow, a framework to the teaching. But since this sentence is found in identical terms in both the official and the apocryphal text, it should not be deemed unimportant. It requires to be analyzed from the esoteric as well as from the exoteric point of view. In these verses, the words multitudes, mountain, and disciples are all of a very great significance. 
The Essene Gospel of Peace shows that the expression multitudes and disciples refer respectively to the exoteric and esoteric aspects of Jesus' revelation. Each verse of the Sermon on the Mount has to be considered from this twofold standpoint. The esoteric revelation is important on account of its all-sidedness and depth, and the exoteric owing to the hundreds of millions who follow it and its historic role in the evolution of the Western world. The expression mountain also has both an esoteric and an exoteric meaning. Exoterically, mountain stands for a material form. For a part of nature, according to the Essene tradition, it is esoterically the symbol of height, of superiority, of the highest degree of individual evolution. The notion of mountain recurs again and again in the history of humanity's great teachers. Thus, Zarathustra lived on a lofty mountain in ancient Samaria before he made known his great revelation. Moses brought down from Mount Sinai the exoteric commandments for the multitudes and the esoteric communions for the elect, and it was into Mount Nebo that he ascended to disappear from history. Jesus likewise chose a mountain for his most important revelation, but it is clear from the text of the Essene Gospel that more is meant than the presence of Jesus on the mountain above the multitude. The symbol of the mountain also means Jesus, the Essene himself, as representing the highest degree of individual evolution, the channel for the absolute and all-sided revelation of eternal truth. In the second verse, there are two important terms, mouth and taught. In a text as important on the Sermon on the Mount, it is not redundancy when Matthew and John write, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Freethinkers have been wont to poke fun at this verse as being pleonastic and illogical. They point out ironically that nobody can say something without opening his mouth, and that nobody can teach without saying something. They take the literal text as it stands without regard to the twofold nature, exoteric and esoteric, of the revelation. In this sentence, every word has its meaning and importance. According to the Essene tradition, a great teacher always used two means for the transmission of his revelation to his followers. First, his voice or word, and secondly, his thought. The term voice or word occurs many times over in all the great sacred books of humanity. The word is a power, an energy, a vibration. It is one of the forces of life and the universe, according to the Essene teaching. The great teachers used the word or voice to set in motion the feeling body of their followers and disciples. The feeling body in Essene tradition consists of the totality of the person's feeling, which form a field of forces around him in the same way that a magnetic field forms around a magnetic pole. Thought, on the other hand, is the power used by these great thinkers to set in motion the thinking body or mind of their followers. The two powerful instruments of the voice and thought have been used repeatedly throughout universal history by all the great masters of humanity for the transmission of their revelations to the feeling and thinking bodies of their disciples and of the multitude. It is these two powers that the words mouth and taught respectively refer. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 3. The third verse, containing the first of Jesus' great teaching, has been much misinterpreted by Bible critics as well as by the Orthodox churches. It is clear that by the expression, poor in spirit, Jesus did not mean of limited understanding. It has a much deeper significance. Again and again in the Gospels we find Jesus stressing the principle of simplicity, and it is no accident that the first of his teaching deals with this principle, which is at once a natural and a spiritual law. And from no law have men and mankind deviated, and do still deviate, as much as from the law of simplicity. In another passage of the Essene Gospel of Peace is found the saying of Jesus that men are masters of everything they possess, which is necessary for individual growth and truth, but that everything superfluous becomes the master of men, and they become its slave. On nearly every occasion of his teaching, Jesus emphasizes the law of simplicity as a natural and a spiritual law. Both in the Synoptic Gospels and in the Essene Gospel of Peace, he makes numerous references to all the kinds of deviation from this law and to the various consequence. Thus he speaks of the impossibility of a rich man entering the kingdom of heaven on account of his unnecessary possessions and of the effect of these upon his consciousness. Likewise, he says that the scribes and the Pharisees, with their burden of intellectual possessions, can in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. 
for this kingdom is harmony with the law. What are the most frequent departures from this basic law of simplicity with Jesus taught? First, from a simple exoteric standpoint, it is a human disease to try always to possess more than is necessary for individual development. When Jesus condemns the rich man, he does not condemn him as a person, but as a deviation from the law. He does not condemn him for his huge wealth in itself, but for the mentality which goes with that wealth. His material possessions will occupy a large part of his feeling and thinking body, of his energies and of his time, to the detriment of the real values of life, of riches and the kingdom of heaven. As we know from the gospel, Jesus had friends among the rich, because he did not consider wealth or possessions as something evil in themselves, but was against the materialism which they engendered. According to the Essene teaching, a rich man with great possessions can work in entire accordance with the law if he does not develop the spirit of materialism which usually goes with them. Conversely, a poor man, without any possessions, may represent a deviation from the law if he is materialistic in his consciousness and desires the wealth which he has not got. Jesus the Essene taught neither poverty nor wealth as an ideal. He simply taught this great law of simplicity that the possession or non-possession of material things should not be made an obstacle to individual advance on the path to the kingdom of heaven. Jesus mentioned other deviations from the law of simplicity besides the possession of unnecessary things. When we carry with us a great burden of traditions, religious, social, racial, which one were adequate and true for their age but are now anachronistic, we are heavily handicapped in our individual development. According to Jesus the Essene, no one with this dead weight of petrified traditions can enter into the kingdom of heaven. We also deviate from the simplicity enjoined by Jesus in the intellectual field. The reading of thousands of books, good and bad, many years of study devoted to the store of static knowledge of past ages, the acquisition of degrees from universities, and the importance attached to these degrees, to the knowledge and to the books. All these things are dead weight carried on the road towards the kingdom of heaven. It is impossible to enter into the kingdom unless every obstacle to the understanding of the truth in its simplicity is first cast off. If we fulfill this prerequisite, we are in an antechamber to the kingdom of heaven. In addition to individual deviations, there are collective deviations by human society from this law of simplicity. Human society and human institutions are, for the most part, based on superfluous, petrified traditions, narrow-minded dogmas, and useless institutions and knowledge, an immense complexity of things totally unnecessary to individual development. The majority of them are not only unnecessary but positively harmful. That is why Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. He taught the greatest values of life and of the universe, but the winning of eternal life is dependent on the sacrifice of all these unnecessary and complex things. The third verse, then, is the exoteric expression of the great law of simplicity taught by the Essene in all ages. The whole Essene brotherhood at the Dead Sea, to which Jesus belonged, was a pure and living protest against the useless complications of the outside world, Contemporary writers describing the Essene Brotherhood at the Dead Sea emphasized the great simplicity of life there. This simplicity is exemplified in the words and teaching of Jesus. A child can understand the Sermon on the Mount and its very simple teaching. Indeed, if a man wishes to understand it, he must become as a little child who is not yet deviated from this great law of simplicity, who does not carry the dead weight of superfluous material, moral and intellectual baggage which burdens us individually and collectively. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Verse 4. Jesus and the Essenes taught not sadness but joy, and joy of life was one of the basic characteristics noted by contemporary writers who visited the Essene Brotherhood at the Dead Sea. The, synop the synoptic gospels and still more of the Essene Gospel of Peace speak again and again of joy and rejoicing, and there is indeed no more optimistic teaching than that of Jesus the Essene. He reveals a law which sets men free, which gives them infinite power and opens the gate to the supreme good, the kingdom of heaven. Since it is evident that Jesus did not teach mourning, what is the connotation of the word mourn from an esoteric standpoint? This verse of the Sermon on the Mount also deals with natural and spiritual law and with the consequence of deviation of one kind or another form from it. 
Another great teacher of humanity, Buddha, expresses a similar thought to that conveyed in this passage when he says that there is in the world an ocean of suffering as a result of deviation from the law and the operation of the law of cause and effect. Buddha uses the Pallavi word samsara to designate this ocean of suffering. According to him, it is suffering to mourn, to become sick, to grow old. It is suffering not to achieve what we have already won. Jesus the Essene also speaks of the ocean of suffering in which humanity lives as a consequence of departure from the law. All men begin their lives in this ocean of suffering. There is none that has not undergone suffering in this world, but suffering is of great value in man's individual development, since it is a force or power which shows him the consequence of deviation from the law. It makes man conscious of his deviations and consequently the law itself. Jesus the Essene never taught suffering. His teaching was joy and fulfillment. In our material life, suffering calls attention to the dangers of deviation from the laws of nature, and its role is the same for the spiritual life and the spiritual law. Mourning thus represents a certain achievement, the attainment of a certain degree of individual evolution, since it is a recognition of the cause of our suffering and a consciousness of deviation from the law and of the law itself. The act of mourning is a necessary milestone in individual evolution, and those who have not reached it cannot progress on the path towards the kingdom of heaven. Without recognition of past error and deviation from the law, it is not possible to begin the new life which Jesus the Essene taught. The start of this new life is marked by mourning or regret for past deviation from the law. But the word mourn has a further meaning. Since most men deviate from the law, most men suffer. They are plunged into the ocean of suffering of which Buddha speaks. It is of the essence of the moral teaching of Jesus that we shall not be indifferent to this great ocean of suffering caused by ignorance of and deviation from the law on the part of the majority of mankind. The ethics of the Sermon on the Mount and the moral teaching of Jesus the Essene stand forth from all the theoretical and purely intellectual constructions and metaphysical teachings which disregard the ocean of suffering around us, which overlook creative love the quintessence of Jesus' teaching, and pay no regard to the great law of compassion. The eternal vitality of the Sermon on the Mount and of all the teachings of Jesus consists in this message of active, creative love manifested in deeds. All the great masters, including Jesus, practiced this law, as did the Essenes who were teachers and healers. They did not live in an ivory tower of their own to merely establish their own harmony with the law, but they went out, they taught, and they healed. Their activity was a wonderful crusade against the ocean of suffering. They brought about the cessation of suffering by taking away its cause in the world. Such is the ethical aspect of the word mourn in the Sermon on the Mount. The good news about the kingdom of heaven brought to mankind by Jesus the Essene is also the good news of the cessation of the suffering of the individual and mankind through understanding and practice of the law and through following of the Master. His life is as important as his teaching because the truth he reveals is at the same time life. His life expressed the truth, and in his life was the truth made manifest. The word mourn in the Essene gospel of peace has therefore several meanings, according as we relate it to the individual or to humanity, to individual evolution or to the creative love, the greatest basic principle of all moral teaching of all ages. Creative love is our duty to the whole world, which is great cause to mourn, since men are plunged into the ocean of suffering brought about by deviation from the law which Jesus taught to mankind in the most sublime and simplest way. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Verse 5. This verse has been given many different interpretations. In the Essene Gospel of Peace, it is not meekness towards man, but meekness towards God, towards the law that is commended. Those who are meek before the law shall inherit the earth. Such is the great law revealed by Jesus the Essene. Throughout universal history, rulers and governments have created their own law and have tried to substitute it for the one law which governs the universe and is the source of all forms of existence. In trying to establish their own law in place of this unique law, the rulers and governments failed in meekness before it and deviated from a great rule of life. At various times in history, an Alexander, a Genghis Khan, a Napoleon, or a Hitler have tried to create their own law and force it on humanity, and so deviated not only from the great law of life taught by Jesus, but from another essentially the same pronounced by Moses. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. 
Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. All the great conquerors set up their own gods. They deviated from the law, and they perished. The law did not destroy them. They destroyed themselves. For the law is good. It sends sun and rain upon the just and the unjust. But all who depart from the great law of life and seek to follow artificial laws made by themselves go forward to destruction. Manifold are the deviations from the great law of life. Not only rulers and conquerors depart from it, but all of us in different ways and in varying degree. In many families, parents offend against it when they create their own law and force it upon their children as a substitute for the only law. Sometimes children seek to create their own law and force it on their parents. Not only dictators, but lesser potentates try to make themselves a law, but such efforts never succeed for long. Men can work only with the law. The most characteristic expression of deviation from it was the remark of Louis the Fourteenth, I am the state. Many of us feel and say and think this is our own humble ways. This law of meekness is manifested as a natural law in the material universe and also as a higher spiritual law. In the material universe, nature has its immutable laws and creates different plants, animals, and races. These creations, following the laws of nature, evolve, and many of them inherit the earth in the sense that they perpetuate themselves and attain increasingly higher degrees of evolution in the course of generations. Other plants, animals, and races deviate from this great law of meekness by making their own law. Non-recognition of the only law means struggle against it and consequent destruction. Such prehistoric animals as a dinosaur and mastodon were very powerful in their time, but more modest creatures adapted themselves to the law and survived while these monsters perished. Man, who by his superior powers lived in closer harmony with this law than any other being on the planet, became the dominant race and thus inherited the earth. Nature, like a sculptor, creates all kinds of forms, and those that do not correspond to the requirements of the law are destroyed. Those conforming to the law and being in full harmony with it survive as nature's masterpiece. In a material universe, the law of meekness is manifested as a process of natural selection. But this great law has also a spiritual aspect. Those who respect the law of meekness before God, before the law, will reach even higher degrees of individual evolution, while those who disregard it and regard themselves as the law create through their absence of meekness before God the greatest obstacle to their development. They will never enter into the kingdom of heaven, which is harmony with the law. When the great master said, Thy will, not mine, be done, he gave perfect expression to this great law of meekness before God, before the law. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Verse 6. The central word in this verse is righteousness, which in the ancient Aramaic means truth. In Aramaic, the same word served for both truth and righteousness. In some versions of the gospel, the word is translated truth and others by righteousness. Both are correct. Truth represents a more universal notion than righteousness, which may be defined as truth manifested in action. If we read, Blessed are they who do hunger and thirst after truth, then we have one of the most universal laws ever revealed in humanity. There are several aspects to this law. A plant, for instance, thirsts for water and hungers for the various ingredients of the earth. It is receptive and assimilates all these preconditions of life. Man, too, has hunger and thirst. His material body hungers for food and thirsts for drink, while his thinking body hungers and thirsts for knowledge, for knowledge of the law, the truth. To be hungry and thirsty is to be receptive and ready to absorb sources of energy and knowledge. According to the great law of life here enunciated, such hunger and thirst are the chief preconditions of individual evolution towards perfection and the kingdom of God. It is the disciples' hunger and thirst which determine the teaching of the Master. The latter is without limit, but the disciple can absorb only so much as his hunger and thirst his receptivity permit. A plant is receptive to earth, water, and sunshine, immense sources of life. If it could absorb its receptivity without limit, it would be able to absorb all the ingredients of the earth, all the air from the atmosphere, all the water and sunshine on the planet. The degree of evolution and perfection reached by an organism depends entirely on its receptivity, of which hunger and thirst are the symbol. While the hunger and thirst of the material body are limited, those of the thinking body for knowledge and truth are boundless. 
Those without this spiritual hunger and thirst will never enter into the kingdom of heaven. One of the greatest gifts that can be given to man is this eternal hunger and thirst after truth and of knowledge. There are people who think they are satisfied, know everything and possess eternal truth, who have lost their hunger and thirst. This is a great mistake. When the hunger and thirst for greater and greater knowledge and higher and higher truth are sacrificed for a particular system of thought or for some teacher or teacher however great there may be, there is an end to individual evolution. One of the reasons for the harsh words of Jesus the Essene against the scribes and the Pharisees was their belief that they possessed the only law and their unwillingness to hear anything new beyond that which they already had. In the light of this law of life, the scribes and Pharisees, who are still among us today, are spiritually dead, though they have the appearance of life. To lose this hunger and thirst for the truth is the greatest disaster that can befall a man. Throughout history, there have been many institutions, hierarchies, religions, and churches which have thought themselves to be in possession of the only law. They persecuted those who still had this thirst and hunger for more knowledge and higher truth, killing, burning, and crucifying them. Most of these institutions and churches are long since dead and gone, but the spirit of hunger and thirst for higher truth lives and is still the dominant law of the spiritual evolution of mankind. This great law is the only one which can save us from the great errors of one-sidedness. Those who have lost the thirst and hunger for truth and are satisfied with some system of teaching become one-sided and search no more for further knowledge and higher truth. They thus set up a wall between them and the cosmic ocean of love and truth, the wall of one-sidedness will isolate them and prevent them from acquiring ever-widening knowledge in the spirit of hunger and thirst after the truth. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Verse 7. This great law of life has several aspects and meaning. The first meaning is that we should be merciful in thought, word and deed towards others. To be merciful is to forgive others to avoid thinking, feeling, and acting in reaction to their negative thought, feeling, and actions. Many are the deviations from this great law. Often we are unmerciful and criticize the words and deeds of other people. We depart from the law in so doing because the only judge is the law itself. We cannot substitute our own judgment for the law. Ethically, we have not the right to think about the faults of others, nor is it logical to do so. We make a double error by introducing into the thinking body inharmonious negative thoughts. We poison the thinking body, which is more important than the material body. In addition, the creation of negative inferior currents of thoughts also affects the person we think about. The molecular motion of our brain causes a resonance in the molecular motion of the brain cells of the other person, with the result that we poison his feeling body as well as our own. The intoxication is thus twofold. Deviation from the great law of life which bids us to be merciful brings about a deterioration of our thinking, feeling, and material bodies, since the glandular activity of the body is responsive to the harmony or inharmony of the nervous system. Even the physical body will suffer the consequence of inharmonious thoughts and feelings. If we look around us, we shall see many deviations from this law of life. Arguments, disputes, gossips, calumny, harsh words, ugly thoughts and feelings. At election time, newspapers are stuffed with the negative thoughts thrown by one party at the other. The struggle between classes in human society is also a deviation from this law of life. When nation speaks against nation and party against party, there is collective departure from the law, bringing suffering to the individual, the family, the community, the nation, and the whole of mankind. An immense price is paid for this deviation, as history past and present shows. When we are not merciful, we dwell in the kingdom of neg negation, peopled by inferior thoughts, feeling, and deeds. This represents a tremendous drag on our individual development, so that instead of progressing, we go downwards. For in the spiritual, as in the material realm, there is no standing still. We go forward or backward. When we lack mercy, we are not merciful to ourselves. This habit of seeing the negative side of things in people makes us dwell in our own negative qualities, in our own mistakes and deviation. Various psychological complexes will develop and subconsciously we shall criticize ourselves in the same way that we criticize others. In this way we become the slave of our own negative thoughts, feelings and deeds, the slave of our own past mistakes. Departure from the law of mercifulness separates us from the kingdom of heaven where there is no negation but only perfection. We should not attack evil which is only negation, but we should strengthen the good. 
in dealing with people. We should look at all their good qualities and try to strengthen these instead of combating the negative ones. By strengthening the good, evil disappears by itself, just as shadow gives way before the light. The law of mercifulness revealed by Jesus is one of the greatest laws of practical psychology and of human relation. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Verse 8. This verse reveals the greatest law of man's feeling body. As already mentioned, it is the Essene teaching that each person has a feeling body as well as a material body. According to the Essene tradition, the pure in heart are those with a pure feeling body, a body nourished by love and not hatred, by forgiveness and not revengefulness, by compassion and not cruelty. Such a feeling body will see God, for he who complies with the great law of pureness of heart is in an antechamber of the kingdom of heaven. If we examine what is behind our action, we shall find there is always a feeling. Powerful feelings and emotions bring about action at once and automatically. It is not thoughts which are behind our action so much as feelings. This psychological fact gives great importance to the law of pureness of heart revealed in this verse. There are many deviations from this law. One of the oldest Therathustrian traditions formulates a simple code of ethics. Good thoughts, good words, good deeds. Here good words represent the feeling body, as behind words there are always emotions and feelings. When Jesus emphasizes the great importance of the heart, of the feeling body, he goes to the root of things below words and deeds, for he knows that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Other teachers before him condemned harsh words, but he annihilates the words before they are pronounced, teaching us how to be pure in heart. If we are, our words and deeds will also be pure and in harmony with the law, the feeling body, the great dynamo of words and deeds, is again and again in the forefront of Jesus' mind, in the Sermon on the Mount, and throughout the Synoptic Gospels. Everyone has probably experienced at some time or another the feeling of being harmonious in the presence of some people and inharmonious in that of others. This phenomena is due to the instinctive reaction of the feeling body. Children very often have this instinct or intuitions in developed form because their feeling bodies have not had time to deviate from the law like the feeling bodies of adults. Even animals with their primitive feeling bodies have this instinct. The feeling body as a feeling of force around us is a great power in individual evolution. If we live according to the law, it can help us raise us higher and higher, but if we deviate from the law, we unleash destructive forces which soon become our masters. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Verse 9. The seventh beatitude reveals a very basic principle or law of life. It proclaims the law of peace. Peace in Aramaic expresses the same idea as the Greek word harmony. Peace, according to the Essene tradition, is harmony with all the powers and forces within and around us. Peace is the most universal and all-sided concept when Jesus said, My peace I give unto you. He gave the greatest of gifts. Peace is the proof, the manifestation of communion with the kingdom of heaven. It is the greatest law revealed in the seven Beatitudes. This is the peace which lightens all burdens, the peace which is the attainment of the kingdom of heaven on earth. All the great masters have had this peace and brought it to humanity. Peacemakers and children of God are synonymous. When we think, feel, and act according to the law, our harmony with it is the kingdom of heaven. When we make peace, we are co-creators with God and continue his work on this planet. The greatest teaching of Jesus the Essene, the nearest to us, of the great masters, is that of the sevenfold peace contained in the Essene gospel of peace. This sevenfold peace is revealed in the seven Beatitudes of the Sermon on the Mount. It means harmony or peace with the body with the mind, with our family, with mankind, with the earth, with all the kingdom of the earthly mother, and with the kingdom of the heavenly father. All-sided harmony is the sevenfold peace, one of the most sublime revelations of all ages. When the Master revealed this greatest of the Essene traditions in all its wonderful simplicity, he established his claim to be one of the greatest teachers of all time on this planet. The Lord's Prayer In the Sermon on the Mount is found the greatest of all prayers, the Lord's Prayer. According to the Essene traditions, prayer is the putting of ourselves in tune with the infinite spirit and cosmic energy, so as to draw upon all the sources of energy, harmony, and knowledge. 
Thus, prayer is not something through which we may modify and influence divinity, but through it we bring about a change in ourselves and get into harmony with all the higher laws and powers. The great Essene master taught men how to pray. In the sixth chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel, he first tells us how not to pray. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corner of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Verses 5-6 through six. Jesus means by this that prayer, putting us into contact with the higher laws and forces, is individual in nature, an inner communion with the Father. It is not a mass demonstration or a public act, but is an inward experience. The inner voice speaks to us in the silence. The great master here reaffirms that true spiritual communion is established within small groups or in solitary converse with the Creator. Elsewhere in the Gospel, Jesus said that where two or three are gathered together in his name, there will he be also. The spiritual unity of man and his Creator is a personal act, or that of a few between whom there is an affinity of thought, word and deed, Godwards. But when ye pray, use not vain repetition, as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Verse 7. By these words the Master rejects all formal written creeds, rituals, and prayers, and their automatic repetition. According to the Essene traditions, all these things tend to harden the spirit and to make static and formal that which is dynamic and immaterial. Everything which intervenes between Creator and man, Father and Son, dividing one from the other, is rejected. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask of them. Verse 8. This is a further warning that we should not ask for specific things in our prayer, because we can ask for all that we have need of, for the kingdom, the inheritance which is ours and is given to us by the Father. When we possess the kingdom, all else will be added. When we pray and put ourselves in tune with the highest power in the universe, which is in us and which we are, then everything is open to us and belongs to us. There is no need for us to limit our request to some little need of the moment. For your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. Our Father knows that what we need is the kingdom of heaven. He knows that this is the greatest treasure which contains all. This he would give to us, this that is so much greater than anything for which we may ask. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thou brother had aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Verses 23 and 24. This is the most important counsel given us by the Master, that when we pray we should have no inharmony in our thinking and feeling bodies, nothing that is negative or limited. Then we shall have perfect peace of mind and the thinking and feeling bodies. No inferior currents of thoughts or feeling will then come near us, and the possible consequence of past negative thoughts and feelings will be eliminated. In complete equilibrium, at peace with ourselves and our fellows, we shall be in a position to receive the highest powers and highest sources of energy, harmony, and knowledge. We shall be able to vibrate in complete harmony with the law. To do this, and this is the inner meaning of this verse, every moment of our life must be a prayer, not only the seventh day of the week or certain times of each day, and we shall thus be in tune with the infinite at every second and minute of existence. The peace and equilibrium will be with us throughout our lives, and we shall be permanently receptive to the higher powers, spiritual, cosmic, and eternal. Then shall we be in real unity with our Father and real harmony with our brethren. Such is the true meaning of prayer. It is how to live and work in accordance with the law, how to establish peace and harmony with ourselves, with the law of the Creator, and with our fellow man. After teaching us how not to pray, Jesus gives us the most classic prayer in the history of mankind. In the Essene scriptures, it is called the Son's Prayer to the Father, not the Lord's Prayer. What is the Essene interpretation of it? Our Father, 
These are the two most wonderful words ever pronounced in the history of man. They express the nature of divinity and man's place in the universe better than the thousands of theological books written through all the centuries because they announce the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man and establish the relationship existing between God and man. These words constitute the simplest and clearest system of theology which has eternal validity. They are the rejection of all the complicated dogmas and theologies of everything which divides man from man and brother from brother. They are the refutation of all false theories based on the superiority of one race over another for one class or religion over another. They represent a clear rejection of all the errors of mankind created by deviation from the law of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. The potent words, Our Father, provide a measure by which to distinguish right from wrong, by which we can know the tree according to its fruits. If the tree does not create harmony between man and his brethren, it is good only for the fire. These words help us to tell that system of thought and movement are in harmony with the eternal principle of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. Our Father expresses the most beautiful relationship possible between Creator and man. To understand the meaning of these words, we have to remember what they stood for at the time they were first uttered in the East. The relationship between father and son was very different than what it is today. In our present materialistic and artificial civilization, the family is no longer the unity that was in days gone by. The average modern family is not an organic unit, but a temporary meeting place between the different members of the family seeing each other once or twice a day and all pursuing different activities and interests. The previous dynamic and organic unity of the family has disintegrated during the last few centuries of technical civilization. The family has lost its spiritual, moral, intellectual, and material unity and has become automatic and mechanical, like the whole of our culture. The inner harmony which once was found in the family group is no longer in evidence. In ancient times the family was such a unity, even economically. The Bible shows us the family working and living together, creating together the basic necessities of life, studying together the moral and spiritual traditions of the people. Sons learn from their fathers. They work and live with them. Each day in the father's house, garden or field, the sons learn some new thing, be it material, moral, intellectual, or spiritual. In those times, the father was the guide and teacher of the family in matters spiritual as well as practical because of his experience of life and knowledge of tradition. There was thus the harmony with an all-sided realization of the law. So when the greatest seen master wishes to express the nature of divinity and the relationship of man with the Creator, he uses the word Father. By this he means the spiritual Father, the cosmic Father, the Father of us all. As our spiritual, moral, intellectual, and even material guide, our Heavenly Father wishes us to be perfect even as He is perfect because the Heavenly Father and the Son are one, which art in heaven. Our Father, the Law, the Creator, is in heaven, is the highest and greatest, is above all things, is the supreme treasure. Our Father cannot be expressed through images belonging to the material limited world, which art in heaven evokes the cosmic ocean of thought, which is beyond the world of matter, the infinite and eternal, as in the Heavenly Father, is indescribable in terms of the temporary and finite. For our Father is in heaven, and not in the formal dogmas of theological systems, not in churches and buildings, not in limited formulas through which men try to compress his Father within limited form. Heaven is the cosmic ocean of thought, but it is at the same time in ourselves, since we are in this infinite cosmic ocean of thought, and it is in us. The kingdom of heaven, therefore, is within us. Hallowed be thy name. The name of the Creator was always deemed holy, as something not to be expressed by a limitation or formality, since there is no name that can convey the meaning of the Creator. For this reason, when the Essene in the Brotherhoods came to the name or symbol of the Creator of the Father, they did not pronounce it, but were silent. Formless silence was to them the only way to express the Father and the inner voice through which He speaks to us. Silence contains all sounds, even as white contains all colors. More than anything else, silence expresses the relationship between Creator and man, between Father and Son. Thy kingdom come. The kingdom, according to the teaching of the Essene, is harmony with the law, or to use the Aramaic and Hebrew term, peace with the law. 
It represents peace with the law and with all the forces working together with the law and spiritual and material universe. In its totality, the kingdom is the sevenfold peace, peace in the feeling body, the thinking body, and the material body, peace with the family and society, peace with the earthly mother and the heavenly father. It is harmony with the infinite cosmic ocean of thought and the infinite cosmic ocean of life. This kingdom is always at hand and accessible whenever we establish ourselves, our peace and harmony with the law. If we have it, we have everything. For if we have it, all else will be added. It is therefore our greatest treasure, our highest good. The most important of the good news which the Essene gave to the world through John the Baptist, Jesus and John the Beloved, was the news that the kingdom is at hand. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The divine will exists in heaven as an ever-present, eternal, and omnipotent reality, and on earth as an ever-present potentiality. This potentiality can be transformed into reality from the moment that our will becomes a divine will, which is absolute in the infinite cosmic ocean of thought. In the instant that we cease to establish our own law and accept the divine law, the difference between heaven and earth will disappear. One of the most important features of the Essene teaching is the unity of the divine will and that of man. For the Essene, there was nothing more essential in life than to give reality to this unity. The book of Genesis tells us that after all living things had been created on earth, God called the animals before Adam, who gave them names. Ever since creation, man has been giving names to things, that is, he has been giving them reality. Man, who has dominion over everything on this planet by the inherent power of his thinking and feeling bodies, has power as co-creator with God to give reality to things. In Genesis, God considers everything he has made and sees that it is good. Man, made in the image of God, continues the work of creation by giving reality to all that is good, in pursuance of the unity of the divine and human will. It was necessary that the great Essene master should emphasize this law in his prayer, because very often, then as now, man gave name and reality to things which had no existence apart from the fact that he gave reality to them. Man gives reality to disease, ignorance, and hatred, to all the negative images he creates. But these cannot exist in a creation which God saw that all was good. When we give reality to evil things that are not real and created by God, then we deviate from the divine will. This sentence of the Lord's Prayer emphasizes law of life, one of the greatest in the Essene teaching and in the Sermon on the Mount. Give us this day our daily bread. Daily bread represents the sum total of the preconditions of our individual happiness and evolution. It stands for bread for the material body, wisdom for the thinking body, love for the feeling body, for all the sources of energy, harmony, and knowledge. It means that we need every day the guidance of wisdom, the warmth of love, and the vitality given by the natural forces, so that our three bodies, acting, feeling, and thinking, may be in harmony with the whole. It is an important law of life that we should so act and feel and think that we absorb continuously thoughts of wisdom, feelings of love and bread of life in a steady progress of the individual evolution. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. This sentence needs to be read in conjunction with that immediately following the Lord's Prayer. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespass. Here is one of the greatest psychological and metaphysical laws. What does forgive our debtors mean? To forgive is to forget. There is no other way to complete forgiveness. We live in a world where the sons of men very often deviate from the law of forgiveness and thus create inferior currents of thought, inferior emotions and acts. All these have reality for us only if we accept them and allow them entrance to our feeling and thinking bodies. If we do not receive them, they have no reality for us. If we know the law, we realize that all inferior manifestations are the consequence of deviations by our fellow men. We forgive and forget them simply by our refusal to think or feel or act upon them. In this way, our thinking, feeling, and material bodies will be untouched by them and our Heavenly Father forgives us our debts because our refusal to deviate from the law, debts do not exist for us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
This is the only negatively phrased request in the whole of the Lord's Prayer. What is meant by temptation? Temptation is the first stage in deviation from the law, the embryo of a thought or emotion leading to such deviation. There is only one commandment in this prayer, because all deviations from the law, to which the Ten Commandments of Moses refer, enter by the gate of temptation and by no other way. The commandment here enunciated is the great law of prevention which applies in every field of life. Prevention of a thing in its initial stages stops it from becoming a full-fledged and powerful reality. Sometimes on high mountains a handful of snow begins to roll downwards. It is easy to stop it with a finger, but as it continues to roll it grows steadily bigger and heavier until a huge mass is formed weighing many tons and bringing destruction in its headlong descent. It is then too late for us to halt it. It is the same with all the process of deviation from the law. As a first thought or feeling of temptation, they can be eradicated easily in collaboration with the law. But if the thoughts and feelings gather strength, it is very hard to avoid submission to temptation and consequent deviation from the law. This great law is here emphasized by the great master. As soon as we put aside temptation, we enter into the kingdom of heaven. As soon as we cease to deviate from the law, we become co-workers with it and are in harmony with the kingdom and all the forces of the spiritual and material universe. What is meant by deliver us from evil? We know that evil has no reality, that everything which was created and found good for this world was an expression of the law, the creator. Evil is simply the product of deviation, of all our past deviation from the law. But even if we have deviated, we are not the slaves of the past, for we have all the potentialities of God's representatives on earth. The kingdom is always possible for us, and knowledge of the truth will free us from all servitude to the past. As soon as we begin to work with the law, the evil, which is the result of our past deviation, will lose its reality and disappear from our lives. We can reach this point by becoming a permanently receptive to the daily bread of wisdom and love. Give us this day our daily bread. This day means that the greatest reality for us is the present here and now. We are not to worry about the past or the future. As Zarathustra said, the past is past and our futures will depend entirely upon the way in which we live the truth and the law in the present. Therefore, life today in harmony with the law will deliver us from evil, the consequence of past deviation. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. The kingdom is the synthesis of all the higher forces. It is the spiritual and material world, the infinite cosmic oceans of life and thought. It is man, life, cosmos, and creator, the totality of all the manifestations of the law. The power represents all the powers and forces which maintains the kingdom, the spiritual powers, natural forces, the power of wisdom, love, and life, the sum total of all the power sustaining the kingdom. In the writing of the ancient Essenes, in the sayings of John the Baptist, Jesus, and John the Beloved, glory is used always of God, of the law, the Creator. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. Glory is the Creator, the law, in accordance with which all the powers work to maintain the kingdom. The kingdom and the power and the glory, the totality of the manifestation of God, the totality of the powers maintaining the kingdom, and finally the law, the Creator Himself. The three words together reveal concisely the quintessence of the Essene teaching. Forever, these two words are the most important words ever written and pronounced. They mean that the law the Creator, God, the spiritual, cosmic and natural forces, and the whole spiritual and material universe are eternal. They mean that we are part of this eternity, that we are one with eternal life, that we are eternal life. The words forever are the revelation of eternal life to man. Amen. This short word has two meanings. In the Aramaic language used in the Essene Brotherhood, Amen has the exoteric meaning, and it shall be so. It is a final affirmation, condensation of the whole prayer into a single word. Esoterically, the word is used in the Essene scripture as a symbol through which the Essene masters of all ages sought to express the divinity. In its esoteric meaning, Amen is the Aramaic form of the ancient Hindu, Om 
which originally consisted of four letters, A-O-U-M. Each of the four letters represent a fundamental manifestation of the law. They stand respectively for power, love, wisdom, and eternal life. Going back even farther, we find this word appearing in the Zen Avesta of Zarathustra in the form of Ashem Vohu, A-S-H-E-M-V-O-H-U. It is exactly the same meaning as to the Hindu Om and the Essene Amen. The Essene used these four letters with minor changes according to the age to represent the manifestations of the law, the Creator. The Creator Himself was expressed only through silence. In keeping with the great Essene tradition, the greatest teacher given by the Essene to humanity ends his prayer, the Son's prayer to the Father, with the traditional Essene word, Amen. The Living Jesus Lecture delivered in 1949 at the Society of Comparative Studies of Ancient Cultures, Tecate, Baja, California. The historian of the future who happens to review all the periods passed through by mankind up to the present will undoubtedly point to the period in which a Sermon on the Mount was heard for the first time as the most decisive for the human race. If ever there should exist not an earthly, but an intercosmic Olympiad of the highest spiritual values of every planet in cosmic space, then our planet would undoubtedly be represented by the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is mankind's title to nobility. It is his right to existence. We must examine the age in which these words for the first time rang forth. It was a time when dark clouds darkened the horizon of people of antiquity, the degeneration and agony of the Roman world empire had begun. In the great capital of Rome there was chaos, disequilibrium, the spirit of violence, the misery of the masses, intrigues of scheming politician and a succession of unbalanced Caesars. Rome's numerous colonies were governed by local Caesars whose corruption was often greater than that of their lords in Rome. We find masses of slaves working in the country while small groups of the wealthy lived in utter luxury and degeneration. In the colonies, of which Palestine was one, the various taxes levied became increasingly unbearable, while from north and east fresh powerful people made their appearance threatening and declining empire with destruction. It was a world which showed every symptom of general disintegration. There was no certainty, no one knew what would happen on the morrow. Everyone lived in constant expectation that something would happen, but without knowing what, expected the present state of affairs could no longer continue. At this, and in preceding periods there lived in Palestine, a people among whom there from time to time appeared men who are something unique in universal history. These men were the prophets. What were they, and what were they not? A prophet was not a priest. He did not learn the laws in the temple, nor had he the authority of the priests. He was not a political leader and had no organization behind him. He led no army. Who were these men who appeared? The prophets were to the Hebrews what philosophers were to the Greeks, lawgivers to the Romans. Each civilization has its characteristic. The prophets of the Hebrews appeared and uttered hard words to kings, to the rich, and to the common people. It was not pleasant to listen to these hard words, for which they said was always, always true. Neither kings, nor priests, nor rich, nor even the people very much liked to hear their message. Yet notwithstanding, these prophets appeared from time to time, and they were asked with what authority they spoke, they answered, I am sent by God. I am come to fight against injustice. I lift up my voice which comes from God, that you may return to the path of righteousness and justice. For your kings are tyrants, your priests are hypocrites, your rich men exploiters, and you men of the people are in sin. Repent and follow my teaching, and the great city of Jerusalem drove out many of these prophets and put them to death, but they always appeared and always lifted up their voices. They are something unique in the history of mankind. They are something that we cannot find in any other society of antiquity, and these prophets were the forerunners of the Son of Man. If we examine the words of Jesus, we shall find that he always referred to the words of the prophets, not to the written word of the law, but always to the living words of the prophets. Let us try and go back to the age and society in which Jesus lived. Let us imagine how the Son of Man appeared among men. We shall see him by the sea, by the lakeside, and in the mountains. We shall see him appearing on the Sabbath in the synagogue. 
Synagogues were not temples, like the great temples in Jerusalem, but were simply houses for study in the small towns, and all who came to them had the right to speak there. So we find Jesus appearing in the synagogues and speaking. In the front seats in the synagogues sat the rich merchants who thought with contentment of the result of the past week's business, and by them sat others who followed with great attention all the prescriptions of the law and the traditional ceremonies. A long way behind sat or stood others, modest and simple folk, humble fishermen, beggars, the blind and the lame, the poor and the miserable. When Jesus spoke, they were all astounded, for the words which they heard sounded quite different to those which were accustomed to hear in the synagogue. What he said shocked those who sat in front, for his words were hard words like those of the prophets. And when he had finished speaking, they went away angry and upset. But those who sat in the back seats of the synagogue, the poor and the miserable, those without possessions and the sick, could not take their eyes from him. For from him they came a new hope, which filled their hearts with a new joy of life. There was a strength coming from this man, a strength they could not understand, so they followed him and accompanied him to the seashore, to the lake or to the mountain. What was this new strength which the Son of Man brought them? He said, Prepare yourselves for the kingdom of heaven which is at hand. And from every city there came the poor, the miserable, the suffering, and the sick, and they sat around him in the mountains and by the sea, and asked him to speak and to say more about this wonderful kingdom which was approaching. And he explained that the kingdom of God was among them and within them, saying that this kingdom of heaven was not identical with the existing world, and he explained that the world which now exists would disappear and be transformed into another world. This world would be a world of the Son of Man. What is the significance of this name, the Son of Man? When he began to speak, he always began by saying, It was said to them of old, and he ended by saying, But I say unto you, Those of old represented man with all his virtues and defects, man who needed hundreds and hundreds of laws and commandments, all of which were written in the old laws. But I, said Jesus, give to you one single law, which is this, Love one another that man may know that you are my disciples. He taught that there must be creative love to build the kingdom of God in which we must become perfect as our heavenly Father is perfect. It is not the old man, not the ancestors who spoke thus, those who needed hundreds of laws and commandments, but it was the man to come, the son of man, the higher man, the man who is no longer man but has become a god, the son of man who speaks and who does not have hundreds of laws and commandments like those of old, but has one single command. Love one another, the command of creative love. The kingdom of God was good news, for man was now ripe for the kingdom of God. Now had come the time for the Son of Man to appear, to establish and inaugurate the kingdom of creative love. When he was asked by whom he was sent, he did not answer that it was the ancient lawgivers of those of old who had sent him. But he said, My heavenly Father sent me. And he said that we should become perfect, even as our heavenly Father is perfect. If we examine his words, they were not like words written in books. In every sentence which he uttered, there is always a picture drawn from nature. He speaks of the sea, or of the fields of wheat, or of fig trees, of peasants working in the fields, of sheep gazing on the side of the mountain, or of the shepherd who cares for the sheep. Pictures from nature come again and again in his words. They are clear, simple words which all can understand, even unlettered folk who never learn to read or write. But they are living words which comfort the sorrowing and those who are heavy laden, words which have color. When they are uttered, then living life enters, as it were, the human consciousness and we feel the truth. It is not the same as when we read a book, to whom did Jesus speak? He did not go to the great city and dispute with the chief priest, with the scribes and with the Pharisees. He did not look for those learned in the laws, but he went by the seashore and spoke to simple fishermen, saying to them, the time has come when we must catch not fish but men. Come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men instead of catchers of fish. And he went to the peasants in the field who were casting seed into the ground, and he said to them, Come and follow me. We must, and go, we must go and sow the seed, not in earth but in men. For the time has come, and we must have a rich harvest, a rich harvest indeed of men. He went and spoke to simple carpenters, saying, Leave your tools. Instead of going on building the house, come with me, and we will build the kingdom of God. 
And the simple fishermen left their nets and the simple country folk their hoes and they followed him. Those who were his first faithful followers or evangelists had very great merit, merit beyond our understanding. For they followed him the very second that he uttered these words. Why did they follow? For in these words was so much life, so much strength, so much clarity and evidence that a second was enough for them to leave their old life, to leave everything and follow him. Why? I must quote their words. Where else can we go, for you and your words are the fount of eternal life? If today someone were to appear and go to the politicians and ministers and tell them to leave their posts and follow them, if someone were to go to bank directors and chairmen of corporations and say, leave all and follow me, or to teachers or salesmen or those who live in the great cities, I doubt very much if anyone would be found to follow them. But these simple folk, fishermen, peasants, carpenters, followed Jesus at once, without doubt and without hesitation. And it is this utter and boundless faith, free of hesitation and skepticism, which is the incomparable merit of these simple, humble folk. And it was this little community of simple, humble folk that the kingdom of God began to be built. And afterwards came shepherds from the mountains, bringing their simple white gifts, milk and butter and cheese and the wool of their sheep, and joined them. And the little company went forth, traveling from town to town. They had only a staff in their hand and a simple garment. And they went from house to house and from village to village to bring to all the good news that the Son of Man had come and was among them, that the kingdom of God was at hand, that men should love one another. And little by little all who felt the lack of something, men thirsting for the truth, came and were satisfied. Those who sorrowed came and were comforted. Those who sought peace came and found peace. Sufferers who suffered in sickness came and found health. All who came laboring under heavy burden had their burdens lifted. And from day to day new, wonderful words were uttered. Such simple words they were, and such clear words with such depth. Words would never before have been uttered, and perhaps will never again be uttered while man is on this earth. As long as these words ring forth, and as long as these words exist around us and resound within us, so long is there and will there be the hope that whatever the disasters and catastrophes which may come to mankind, everything is not lost, but there will always be hope for us, the way, the truth, and the life. Afterwards came dogmatists, fanatics, philosophers, and pendants who tried to build a complicated system of theory upon the basis of the simple, natural, and clear word of Jesus. Dogma followed upon dogma, but they never succeeded in destroying the eternal vital strength and beauty of those simple and clear words. In spite of the fact that his words were distorted, in spite of the fact that they were misused, they cannot be destroyed. All the book burners of history would not be able to entirely erase the vivid power of Jesus' teaching. I must tell you of a beautiful medieval legend which inspired Dostoevsky to write his masterpiece called The Grand Inquisitor. According to this legend, in the days of the Spanish Inquisition, when lofty flames rose in all the cities of Spain, when they burned living men in the name of the Son of God and with the signs of the cross, Jesus cast his eyes back over the earth and returned among men. He appeared in Toledo, and when he drew near to the chief square of the city, he saw that there was a great fire and that they brought men to burn there. And those who cast the men into the flames bore the crosses in their hands. Jesus called one of them to him and asked, What are you doing? He answered, We are burning heretics in the name of our holy church and in the name of Jesus Christ. Then Jesus asked, Who commanded you to do these things? And he whom Jesus asked pointed to the citadel of the city and said, Our master, the chief inquisitor, who is the representative of the holy church, bade us to do so. Then Jesus went to the citadel and opened the inquisitor's door and asked him, In whose name do you do all these terrible things? And he answered, In the name of Jesus Christ must we destroy all the heretics who can endanger his teaching. Then Jesus said, I am Jesus. I brought love to you, that you might love one another, that you should forgive the sins of others. I brought joy to the hearts of men, and you changed the world into a sad house of tears. I brought love, and you make a world of cruelty. I brought life, and you scatter death. Ordered whence that the flames be put out, that the captives be freed, so that my teaching may be fulfilled. The chief inquisitor looked at him, and straightway began to tremble beneath the weight of his words, for he felt that this man was truly he, and he felt the force of Jesus' words. Minutes passed, and he made no answer. 
At last he lifted his eyes and saw the official decree upon the wall. Then, gathering all his strength, he answered Jesus, saying, You are right, but your ideal is only an ideal and cannot be achieved. Our church is a church militant, and we can conquer the whole of mankind only by battle and by force. I regret it, but I cannot obey your word. Then Jesus answered, I will go back among the people and will again lift up my voice, and I will tell all that you are not my representative. I will say, I do not wish that you should be put men to death. I do not wish that you should imprison men. I wish you to know that love is not hate, that life is not death. Then the chief inquisitor rose and said to him, If you speak these words among the people, if you struggle against our church, I shall be obliged to burn you also, for you are dangerous. Then there fell a great silence. Jesus answered nothing, but tears came into his eyes, and he disappeared from before the eyes of the chief inquisitor. But from these tears there came a heavy shower of rain, which put out all the flames in the city. And there came also from his tears a flood, which overthrew all the cities and all the churches. And this new flood continued like the floods in the Bible, and when the waters receded, there came a new age." and there were heard in their original purity and clarity the words of love, the words of eternal life. This medieval legend, in truth, makes us sense a great tragedy. It is an eternal tragedy of man, happening today as well as long ago. That words of love are changed to words of hate. That life is changed to death. And the original, simple, dynamic idea of Jesus is destroyed by rigid dogmatism and one-sided faith without the light of reason. Now let us examine what was this teaching of the Son of Man which brought such vital force. Was it a philosophical system? Was it a science? Was it a collection of laws? No, it was not. The central force which took hold of men and changed them was he himself, his life, his example, the integrity and completeness of his life. It was not only his words, but himself and his living example. They came and asked him diverse questions, but he always answered with simple, clear, and few words. He always gave that which he was asked. To those who were sad, he gave joy. To those who were ignorant, he gave knowledge. To those who were at war with themselves and with others, he gave peace. To him who had not found quiet, he gave quiet. To him who suffered with pain and with illness, he gave health. He always gave that which was needed then and there, and never spoke about anything which was not asked, which was not wanted immediately with urgent necessity. He did not make and create a philosophical system for the future. He simply created constantly new values and distributed them to all, to all who needed them, to all who came to him. Now let us examine the one thing which he did not give, for which he was asked. He never refused the sick who came to him, asking what they should be healed. He never refused the ignorant who came that they might learn. But there was one whom Jesus refused when he came to him, and asked for a sign and asked for miracles. For this request was a sign of doubt and misunderstanding of him. We can see that our greatly distorted texts speak of this supernatural miracle. He always rejected these categorically. Whence does this belief in supernatural miracles come? It has its roots in the human consciousness, which construes as supernatural and miraculous all those acts which it does not understand. Jesus did not need to do supernatural miracles. He was in possession of all the natural and cosmic forces and of all the natural and cosmic laws. He did not need to do miracles, for it was in his power to do all without miracles. He could heal the sick, for in his power were all the forces of nature and all the forces of thought. And he could answer all the questions which he was asked, for he had in his power for knowledge of every natural and cosmic law. So he refused when he was asked for a sign, for he was truly sent by God. He answered, Go hence from me, unbelievers. For he knew that the sign should not appear in heaven, but should appear in ourselves and our hearts, for the kingdom of God is in ourselves. For the light is always visible. One has only to see and open one's eye, but for those who have eyes and do not see, or for those who have ears and do not hear, for them the supernatural miracles are in vain. The light is always visible to those who are able to see, and the light illumines itself and also the darkness. But as long as the blind live, the blind will always fall into the pit. Jesus did not speak to those who did not feel and who did not see, but he speaks to those whom he sent. Happy are you, for your faith sustains you. And to the sick whom he healed, he said, Be it according to your faith. For it is in vain we hold out our hand to raise someone if he turns away and will not take our hand. 
In his power, he had all the natural and cosmic forces and laws. He was conscious of the force of thought. The force of thought, which he irradiated, are only able to enter those who are good receivers, who wish to receive. The human organism is a receiving instrument we receive from forces which live around us, from the air, from the tree, from the sun, from the earth, and the natural forces meet in our organism. And Jesus sent the sick to the rivers and to the lakes that they should go into the water, that they should fast, and that they should walk among the trees of the forest. Fast and pray. What is fasting and what is prayer? We know the miraculous force of fasting. We know that this force is able to cure all disease. We know the miraculous force of the sun whose rays traverse the human organism. We know the miraculous force of water which cleanses the human organism just as the rain cleanses the earth. Jesus opened the door of the human organism and all the creative forces of nature so that the weak and sick bodies who dipped into the river of natural forces and thereupon miracles occurred. Men who had been sick for years and diseased for years became whole men, men whose eyes had been dark for year after year could see, men whose ears had been stopped for years and years could hear, men who had lain in bed for long years began to walk, and a very large number of the sick came to him, and those who believed in him were cured. But he did not only tell them to go to the lake or to go to the forest, to go into the forest and fields and fast, but he also told them to pray. What is prayer? Prayer is nothing else than the creation of forces and currents of thought, and the direction of our currents of thought to the eternal boundless ocean of all higher currents of thought, which currents come to this eternal cosmic ocean from all the higher beings of every planet. The boundless eternal ocean of superior currents of thought has its eternal source in every form of life and cosmic sphere. There is an eternal cosmic ocean of thought, of life and love. For only those higher energies can reach this cosmic ocean which have reached the higher stage of evolution and are able to overcome the sphere of gravitation upon our planet. This is the eternal source and foundation of life. Planets and solar systems appear and disappear, but this dynamic, vital ocean of currents of thought remains eternal and is the creator of every individual form of life on every planet. This is the heaven of which Jesus always spoke, and this eternal cosmic ocean of life, of higher currents of thought and of love, is our Heavenly Father. Jesus said, I and my Heavenly Father are one. He spoke truly, for he was in contact with this eternal, boundless cosmic ocean, and he drew from this eternal ocean ever stronger and stronger currents of eternal life which flowed through him and those who followed him. And he opened the door to the superior cosmic forces, allowing them to flow through himself to the men who followed him. He asked men to pray. He showed them how to search for content with this eternal ocean, source of energy, of knowledge, and of harmony, by concentration of currents of thought. For to him who seeks shall be given. Men came and saw miracles, the sick in mind, who in those days were said to be possessed, whose nervous systems were damaged, regained their harmony and peace through those higher forces which irradiated from the Son of Man. There came lepers who were cast out of society, who were forbidden to have contact with whole men. These Jesus sent to the river, bidding them fast, and they ate nothing but the wild grapes among the valley. And they prayed, and their skin grew clean, and a great miracle took place, and lepers became whole. They were baptized by water and by spirit, that is, they were baptized by natural forces and also by higher cosmic forces, and they became whole. And in accordance with the laws of the day, they went to the house of the priest to declare that they were whole and clean. And when the priest had declared that they were whole and clean, then they were readmitted into society. When they were asked who cured them, they answered, He who calls himself the Son of Man. He forbade the sick to speak about their healing, for he wished men to come to him, not from belief in miracles, in the supernatural, but through conviction from belief, from understanding. Those who come for miracles come for things they do not understand, while Jesus wished them to come for things which they understood. He wished them to understand the natural laws which he taught, and wished them to go among men and spread knowledge of these natural and cosmic laws. That mission could only be accomplished by those who understood and believed, and not by those who looked for miracles and did not understand. All the words of Jesus are clear and simple. He is the clearest teacher of mankind. When the news of Jesus' works and teaching reached the great city of Jerusalem, the unbelievers and skeptics, the unjust, the dogmatic, the hypocrites, the scribes, and the Pharisees who followed the law in a letter but disregarded its spirit were scandalized. Yet some of them sent and sought Jesus and put various questions to them. 
In their meeting, we witnessed the struggle between two different knowledge, one knowledge which comes from written letters, the knowledge of science of the scribes and the Pharisees, and the other source of knowledge, the living knowledge, which comes from the source of the eternal cosmic ocean, which is a superior living source of knowledge. From the dialogues of Jesus with the scribes and Pharisees, we can see the incomparable superiority of this living knowledge. The same words of Jesus were always repeated. How is it that you who are accounted wise among Israel do not know this or that? And the scribes became confused and went away. Then they came with various ambiguities to trip him up, but always it was themselves who went away discomforted. Jesus' answers were so clear, so simple, and so profound that it is impossible to find anything like them in the whole history of human thought. When they came seeking to confound him and ask him whether it was right to pay taxes to Caesar, what did he answer? If he had answered that they should pay the tax, then he would become unpopular among the masses. While if he had answered that he should not pay the tax, they would have denounced him as an enemy of Caesar and had put him to death. How simple was his answer? Show me the coin. Whose superscription is on the coin? And they answered, That of Caesar. Render therefore unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and unto God that which is God's. What then is God's? Even life, for God is God of the living and not the God of the dead. When he met those who wished to stone to death the adulterous woman, he forbade them, saying, Let him be the first to throw a stone who is without sin himself. And they all went away from the one and the other. What profundity, what satire in those words, not even the words of Voltaire can surpass the fineness of these words. I could give many such quotations, what simple, clear, and profound words. We can see that the truth always and everywhere proves and manifests itself. There were the Son of Man appeared, everything was transformed. All who were around him received a higher gift, and everywhere he was there always appeared the kingdom of God. Suffering were transformed into peace. Ignorance was changed into knowledge, unbelief into belief and darkness into light. Whence did these miraculous powers come? He also he always answered, From my heavenly Father. And truly, the more strength and energy he gave to others, the more strength and energy he had. For the source of his knowledge and the energy and harmony was the boundless universe, the inexhaustible, eternal cosmic ocean of higher forces, thoughts and love which flowed through him to the whole of mankind. These forces will never disappear, for higher cosmic forces cannot be lost just as science establishes that energy can never disappear. And when Jesus spoke with his disciples before his death, he told them not to weep and not to be sad, for he would not leave them. Instead of them, they would have the Comforter, who would always console them. I will be with you always, and everything which you ask of your Heavenly Father in my name shall be given to you. What did these words, in my name, mean? Was the name important for Jesus? It is clear it is not the name which mattered, for when people asked him what they must do, he always said, Observe the law, come and follow me. It was the following of example of his life which he meant. To those who followed his way of life, all the harmony of the natural and cosmic forces and laws would be given. They would have the same contact with the Heavenly Father. They would enjoy the same higher source of energy of knowledge and harmony coming from this eternal cosmic ocean of harmony and love. For with man many things are impossible, but with our Heavenly Father all things are possible. And for those who have this higher contact, everything is possible. Jesus said, Neither heat nor cold nor the bite of serpents can do you harm. What did he mean? If we live in harmony with the natural forces, nothing can do harm to our body. Likewise, if we live in harmony with the superior source of energy coming from the eternal cosmic ocean of our Heavenly Father, nothing can do harm to our consciousness and spirit. So the ideal is to be perfect, even as our Heavenly Father is perfect. The Heavenly Father and I are one. In truth, Jesus did not die upon the cross. The powerful currents of energies with which he aroused mankind and which he irradiated to them are eternal living forces which represent a great and inexhaustible treasure for humanity and will continue so long as man lives upon the earth. His teaching was universal, and his teaching is and always will be actual. For his teaching is harmony of man with himself, of man with other men the harmony of mankind with all the forces and laws of nature, the harmony of mankind with the eternal cosmic ocean of higher forces which eternally create, destroy, and recreate planets and solar systems in cosmic space. 
His teaching is always and everywhere. His teaching is so clear and simple and always indisputable, in spite of the hundreds of misinterpretations made of his words. When people have tried to create dogmas and philosophical systems out of his ideas, the eternal vitality of his words will survive everything. No dogma or fanaticism can survive, for it is contrary to the natural force and laws, but his teaching, the embodiment of harmony, with all the natural and cosmic laws and forces, remains eternal and valid. It is indestructible and cannot be deformed. We must follow his teaching. We must look for the superior sources of knowledge, energy, harmony, and love. We must always seek contact with these superior sources through leading a simple, natural life like the life of Jesus and his disciples. We shall be changed in a more and more perfect receiving apparatus for establishing contact with all these higher sources of energy and harmony. Then will the truth always be made manifest in itself. This is a living truth of living God for a living man. We must not look for the truth in books, but in the path given to us by the Son of Man. Then all men will be transformed into sons of men, and the new man will appear, who will be the same as our Heavenly Father. He will be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, and then will there be peace in ourselves, the peace which does not yet exist, for we have antagonistic forces in our bodies. We have still inferior forces of the old man, of our ancestors, to whom we are given hundreds of laws. And even those hundreds of laws were not enough, but to us is given one single law, love one another, not only in words but in deeds. The teaching of Jesus can be summed up in two words, creative love, which everywhere and always creates new values and changes the kingdom of man into the kingdom of God. If this peace appears in ourselves and among ourselves, if the kingdom of God is in us and among us, then this peace will be universal, and there will be no more problems in the teaching of the Son of Man will be fulfilled, and there will be peace in and around us. So this higher peace, peace with ourselves, peace with all the forces of nature, and peace with all the higher cosmic forces and laws, will be a universal harmony. So Jesus and his disciples always greeted one another, Peace be unto you. This peace is ours in a universal sense, and this peace can be acquired by all of us. He showed to us the way, the truth, the life, and the peace, so I say a farewell also to you with his words. Peace be unto you. The Meaning of Christmas The Essene Significance of the Great Anniversary Lecture delivered in 1937 at the International Health and Education Center, Leatherhead, Surrey, England. First, Christmas existed before Christianity. It was an ancient pagan festival for the rebirth of the sun. In Heliolithic times, it was celebrated during the period of the year which we call December. Something very important happened at that time. The days began to grow longer, the forces of the sun began to grow greater, and life began to manifest itself on every side. Life began to stir in the seeds planted in the ground and plants in the trees. Every form of life began to go through a great change under the influence of the sun, the great regulator of earthly life. This was observed in prehistorical times, and the priesthood passed this observation from generation to generation, from father to son. Something of great import happened at that time. The sun was born again, and with the sun the whole of earthly life. Its rebirth gave vital force not only to plants but to animals and men as well, and this great event was celebrated with much ceremony. The earliest literary work known to us in the history of mankind is the Egyptian Hymn to the Sun, an apotheosis of the sun which began thus, Thou great source of life which each day and every year has renewed each of us, animals, plants, and men, we await thy return from winter. What would happen if one day thou shouldest not return? Everything would become dead. The earth would die. Plants and animals would die, and we ourselves would wait for death, our bodies the victims of the shades of night. For it is thy rays which sustain our life and everything which lives upon the earth. Since this first hymn to the sun, we have a long series of different hymns and books of ancient philosophies and religions, which to a large extent are concerned with the rebirth of the sun at the end of the year. The last manifestation of this ancient pagan adoration of the sun is the hymn to the sun of St. Francis of Assisi, which is a masterpiece of universal literature. We can see that from prehistoric times, right through all the ancient cultures, up to the time of the hymn to the sun of St. Francis, man is either instinctively or more or less consciously recognized that for those who dwell upon this planet the greatest determining force is the sun. 
They have realized that this determining force goes through a great change at the end of the year. Hence, without exception, in every prehistoric and ancient people, we find the cult of the sun the form of a festival for the renewal of the sun and the earth. This festival was the precursor of our Christmas. We must next examine what new elements were introduced into this festival with Christianity. It is clear that Christianity did not take over this ancient festival in its original form, just as it stood, but Christianity improved and perfected it, adding the rebirth of man and the salvation of mankind to the rebirth of the sun and the earth. Christmas is very widely celebrated. Some celebrate it religiously, others dogmatically, others literally, others skeptically, others quite automatically without thinking much of its significance. Yet no one really knows the central import of this festival, for it is also at the same time the essence of Christianity itself. For instance, such fundamental notions of Christianity as the Immaculate Conception, the salvation of mankind, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection all have their explanation in the true significance of Christmas. I will now explain these ideas in the light of the natural and cosmic forces and laws. Bernard Shaw was once asked, Do you believe in the Immaculate Conception? And he answered yes. Naturally, people were very surprised that such a skeptic should believe in such a thing, so he was asked a second time and he answered again. Yes, because every conception is immaculate. Here I must add a few words to this observation. If the immaculate conception has any meaning at all, it has a meaning only in the following way. We know very well, at least those who have read my books on natural health and natural living, that if a mother lives completely in harmony with the natural forces and law during the months of pregnancy, then the organism of the newborn will be quite perfect and will not inherit disease and unfavorable hereditary disposition. The child's organism and blood will represent the law itself. On the contrary, if during pregnancy the mother feeds on toxic elements like nicotine, alcohol, drugs, etc., and generally leads an unnatural life, then the newborn will inherit all the unfavorable disposition to the parents, in which case, from the point of view of the laws of nature, we cannot speak of an immaculate conception. So from the empirical point of view of the natural laws, immaculate conception means conception and birth under the circumstances that the mother lived completely in harmony with the natural laws during the whole period of gestation. In this case, possible unfavorable hereditary dispositions will not be manifest in the life of the newborn, during the first two centuries of primitive Christianity, great significance was attributed to the manner of life during the month of pregnancy. The traditions and documents which have gone down to us tell us that the first Christians lived a completely simple and natural life, just like their Essene master Jesus. They were generally peasants, fishermen, simple folk who lived in close proximity with the soil, in close contact with nature, spending their days in the sun, in the water, and the air, and whose food was natural and simple. It was in this sense that that of the conception of Jesus was regarded as immaculate. Let us consider what is meant by the Christian doctrine of the salvation of mankind by Jesus Christ. The dogmatic view is that Jesus saved mankind by his death. We feel compelled to object to this conception, and on the contrary, to say that Jesus saved mankind not by his death, but by his life and by his teaching. He taught us the natural and cosmic laws in the way to the perfection of mankind. Of what did these cosmic and natural laws consist? Jesus' disciples who followed him where he went were all simple folk, fishermen and peasants. He taught none among those who lived in the cities, not among scribes and Pharisees, but among simple people of humble birth. He taught them the laws of a natural and simple life, telling how man can be reborn by knowledge and practice of natural and cosmic laws. He healed the sick, but he healed not only in body, he taught not only the renewal of the body, but also the renewal of man's consciousness and spirit. It is at this point that we find a contact between Christianity and the true significance of Christmas. Can we doubt that if mankind were without exception to following the teaching of Jesus, it would be saved? Would there not be peace and harmony upon earth? Assuredly there would. By his example, by his activity, by his whole life and by his teaching, he showed the path of salvation of mankind. Jesus, however, made it clear that he had not come to save mankind from ignorance and selfishness. So he did not save mankind, but showed mankind the path to salvation. Each must save himself. No one else can save him. It is the task of each to fulfill for himself. No external mystical act can save a man, nothing but his own will and intelligence. 
So Jesus showed to the whole of mankind the path which leads to a simple life, which leads to a natural life. He showed the path of harmony. He said, those who keep the law will never look upon disease. And we know indeed that we cannot be ill if we live in accordance with the laws of nature. We know that disease and all other inharmonious come only if we fail to adapt ourselves to the natural force. We know very well that a simple and natural life means not only health, but also independence. If we were all to live simply and naturally, we would be without many of the dangers and complications of contemporary life. There would be an end to violence. For when the earth gives all the necessities of life, the essentials for our existence, we have no need to exploit others. We would not have exploitation and so would be without class struggles, revolutions, counter-revolutions and similar phenomena. We would not have violence under any form. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. He gave to mankind a supreme ideal which unfortunately we have not so far succeeded in putting into practice. He showed mankind the way to live and the path to salvation by his humble birth and appearance and by his life. He showed mankind that just as the sun and earthly life are reborn each year, so likewise must men also be reborn themselves. We must be reborn to a new life, just as the whole earth is reborn to a new life. We must be reborn not only by a new way of life, but also through our thoughts and through our spirits. For just as inharmonious foods destroy the harmony of our organisms, so do inharmonious, negative, unpleasant thoughts destroy our spirits. Jesus understood very well that there is still a great deal of our ancestors in us, that there is in us still much of homo chromagnenesis, homo neanderthalus, and perhaps even of our distant prehistoric ancestors, such as the lithosaurus and the mastodon. The whole human mechanism with its nervous system is under the influence of savage hereditary instincts which impel us to violence, driving us to hate instead of to love. Jesus understood well that man is a complicated mechanism made up of various sentiments which dominate man and impel him to be evil. There is also in man a quite new activity, namely sense and intelligence. But human intelligence is very young, only some thousands of years old, while our hereditary instincts are many hundreds of thousands of years old. So we know the good, but in practice we follow what is evil. But the evil which man does is not his fault, for it is blind forces inherited from his remote ancestors which govern him. So we must have forgiveness. We must forgive once, twice, seven times, and if necessary, seventy and seven times. So we find the idea of forgiveness of sins in the center of Jesus' teaching. We must have a more perfect understanding of the imperfections of man. We must realize that it is not our own fault if we are evil nor have we the right to pass judgment upon others, for none among us is perfect. Let him be the first to throw a stone who has no sin himself. The forgiveness of sins has therefore a strong foundation in the light of our knowledge of the laws of hereditary and biology. In objection it may be said that man has made very little real progress since Jesus' time, with such great chaos, so much hate, so much selfishness and violence and ignorance in the world today. Perhaps the supreme ideal, then, has had no real effect on the life of mankind. But I do not think that such an objection can be sustained. For in spite of all the unfavorable symptoms which undoubtedly exist, there is nevertheless still hope. So long as the words of the Sermon on the Mount live in the hearts of men, everything is not lost. In spite of wars, in spite of persecution, in spite of the daily denial of the teaching of Jesus, we must not abandon hope, for his teaching represents a great force. If I remember well, it is the English poet, Swinburne, who wrote that there is only one great force which no one can ever enslave or destroy, and that great force is thought. What are we to understand by that? We know very well that thought is not only certain process of the cerebrospinal system, but is a universal energy like electricity or magnetism, though I do not mean to suggest any mystical significance by the use of the term. The human organism is an accumulator nourished by certain material energies and also creates certain forms of energy, a particular one of which is thought. Thoughts have a great effect upon the human organism. Men with harmonious thoughts have them written on their faces in their very movements. We can see the transforming force of thoughts as energies. The human organism is capable of perceiving currents of thought just as it is capable of receiving currents of magnetism, electricity, and light. The receiving apparatus or antenna for these currents is the cerebrospinal system. We are all of us constantly receiving radiation of thought and are all constantly creating our own currents of thought. 
Contemporary psychotechnicians, for instance, by means of a special sensitive apparatus, are able to measure different intensities and qualities of thought. This science is still in its infancy, but it has already succeeded in showing that thought is a specific form of universal energy. We can make an experiment ourselves. If we are among people who have inharmonious, unbalanced thoughts, then we feel a certain depression. But if, on the contrary, we are among people who are well-balanced and have harmonious thoughts, then we have agreeable sensation. Very often we cannot understand why we feel well in the society of some people and not so well in the society of others. This gives the explanation. Thoughts have great significance. In the light of the laws of thought, we can understand very clearly the truth of Jesus' teaching, that it is not necessary to commit a sin, but enough simply to think it. Indeed, an inferior thought itself, without external realization, can have a destructive force, while a good thought can have a perfecting and harmonious force. Hence the commandment that we should love one another, that we should have thoughts of love. This command is also based on the law of nature. It is not a mystical and illogical command, a mere moral postulate, but is a real direct force which plays a great role in our lives. If we have inharmonious or violent thoughts against others, we harm not only others but ourselves because we destroy our own organism and nervous system by them. Thus love is the central pivot of the teaching of Jesus. Love is a psychophysiological law, a law of nature and not only a trite moral precept. The thoughts which we create do not simply disappear any more than matter disappears. Nothing among the various forms of energy disappears, whether it be electricity, magnetism, light, or thought. And truly the thought of Jesus and the thoughts of the first Christians in their original purity did not die with the first Christians. Their thoughts were real forces and as real have survived. Jesus said to his disciples, Believe in me, I have overcome the world. He overcame the world because he created a great and powerful force, a force of supreme thought, the understanding of the laws of nature in their totality. Jesus' words, which are so simple and natural, are thoughts which show to mankind the path to resurrection, to the realization of the true values of life. There is nothing mystical in the words of Jesus. They are most direct, the most simple and most profound words which have ever been pronounced in the history of mankind. We celebrate his birth on Christmas Day. We also celebrate the pagan ideal, which was the rebirth of the earth and the sun, to which Jesus added the rebirth of man the rebirth of our bodies and of our health, the rebirth of our spirit. We celebrate the path leading to the rebirth of the whole of mankind, which will lead to the winning of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of salvation. When Jesus spoke of himself, he called himself nothing but the Son of Man. The Son of Man. What do these words mean? They mean the man who is to come. For man now is imperfect the child of selfishness and violence, without knowledge of the cosmic and natural laws and forces. But if we follow the path which Jesus showed to us, then will come a new man, the Son of Man. He it will be who will achieve the kingdom of heaven upon the earth, the kingdom of love and of peace, the kingdom of harmony. Such is the essential significance of Christmas. We celebrate it not only as an ancient pagan festival, but we also celebrate much more. We celebrate the birth of the Master, who is a symbol of the rebirth of the individual and of mankind, a symbol of that creative ideal which guides and has guided in every age that small elect of mankind, which instinctively, or more or less consciously, or simply by genius, possesses knowledge of the laws of nature. Christmas has indeed a very profound significance. It shows that Jesus had much teaching for modern man, not dogmatic teaching, but teaching which is an actual now as it was 2,000 years ago. If he were now among us and were to give us a message in the language of today, he would say, I brought you love, and you hate one another. I said that he who used the sword should perish by the sword, and you wage war and slaughter one another. I taught you to live simply, and you have built great cities, forsaking nature and living far from the fresh air, from sun, from water, and from all the force of nature. I taught you on the seashore, by the sides of the lake and on the mountaintop, and you have built great temples of stone for your worship. I healed the sick and showed you the way to health that you might never look upon disease, and now you are all sick. Never have there been so many diseases and so many sick people as now. I taught you a simple, natural life without riches. I taught you not to think of the morrow, and now you accumulate money and possessions, adding house to house, and for this exploit one another. 
I taught you the two laws of harmony and of a harmonious life, and now you just do the contrary to my teaching. You gather together in great stone temples, and you pray to me and ask me to help you and save you. Do you not remember that I taught that salvation was for him who knew and followed the law? How would you say that I should save you if you will not save yourself? Such might be the words of Jesus if he were here among us in these days. There is much truth in them, and we should pay heed to them. For neglect and non-observance of his teachings have brought unbelievable misery to mankind and threaten the still greater danger of mankind, a danger the like of which he has never before seen in human history, that in the hands of a world whose spiritual evolution has lagged far, far behind its technological progress is now the power to completely destroy this planet. This danger to mankind has never existed before. If we wish to be faithful to the true spirit of Christmas, we should answer Jesus thus, Truly, we have done much evil, and the iron law of cause and effect will overtake us. Great upheavals and disasters as a consequence of our inharmonious and unbalanced way of life are unavoidable. They cannot be escaped. But we hope that those in whose thoughts and consciousness the higher ideals which you taught remain will be able, after the great storm and disasters are past, to build again mankind and human culture on a true foundation in harmony with the laws of nature and with moral ideals. We must not expect a mystical salvation, but must hope that after the great disaster we shall be renewed, just as each year the sun and earthly life are renewed, and we must hope that through the creative force of thoughts and ideals given us by the Essene Jesus, these ideals will be fulfilled. We must hope that we shall learn from the hard lessons to be received that we shall have to do better in the future. We must recognize that we have done badly up to now. This must be our hope. It is only this which can make bearable for us the present atmosphere before the storm breaks forth. I hope that you will all think about these things during our every Christmas festival, which is but the symbol of the truth which Jesus taught and which he lived nearly 2,000 years ago. Christianity vs. Jesus Lecture delivered in 1967 at the Academy of Creative Living, Mill Robles, California. The true meaning of the word religion is beautifully expressed by the Latin verb religare, which means to connect. Religion is indeed that which connects man with the whole cosmic ocean of life with the universe, and by so connecting him it defines his role in the world and the purpose of human life. It gives meaning and a practical program for man's daily living. In this sense, religion is of great importance to us. But religion, conceived as hundreds of theological dogmas and a variety of formal rituals, may well represent an obstacle in the path of man's individual evolution. However, religion should not on this account be rejected. But a distinction must be made between religion in its true meaning and the dogmatic view of it held by the majority of mankind today. During the history of mankind there have been many religions. However, the laws of life in the universe are the same today as they were 2,000 or even 8,000 years ago. The different religions try to express these great laws for the benefit of mankind. The expression assumes different forms according to life, age, environment, culture, and civilization, and takes into account the degree of man's evolution at each period. Among the great religions of the world are the Avistic religion of Zarathustra, the religion of ancient India, Vedism, Brahmanism, Buddhism, the teaching of Jesus and the Gospels, the teaching of Moses, Confucius, and Lao Tzu, There is one thing common to all these religions and teaching. Each begin with the appearance of a great genius, a great teacher, generally in an age when the horizon was dark and mankind was groping to find its place. At such a time the meaning and purpose of life are confused and uncertain. It is usually in the intergroom between the death of one civilization and the birth of another that a great religious genius appears. He has a beautiful intuition of life in the universe. He teaches it and exemplifies it in his life. He gathers followers, and the eternal vitality of his message brings meaning and happiness into the lives of millions. On the foundation of the teaching, a great culture is raised in the course of centuries. Then, with the passage of time, the beauty and magnificence of the basic intuitions are whittled down, because the ability of the master's followers does not match his own. Their interpretations add various incoherencies to the original purity and simplicity of the great teaching, so that gradually the intuition becomes more static and is petrified in dogma, in tradition, and in institutions. 
the teaching becomes steadily less efficient in its role of transforming the lives of men to bring them into harmony with the laws of the universe and of life. Eventually another religion appears, but in turn it shares the same fate. The dynamism of the original intuition gradually fades, gaining its extensions as it becomes adapted by millions, but losing in depth and quality. In time it is supplanted by another. Since the basic laws of life and the universe are always and everywhere the same, there are no contradictions between the great religions of mankind. In their original purity and simplicity they are one, and the contradictions only appear after many generations when the religion is represented by commentaries upon commentaries upon commentaries. As it becomes more complex, it becomes more limited and encased in increasingly rigid institutions. Eventually, it is little more than a formality far removed from the intention of its great founder. Instead of reflecting its creator, it reflects the minds of millions who do not possess his great comprehension and intuitive sense. Such is the tragedy of all the great teachings of the mankind. It follows that when we wish to analyze and understand a great religion, we must first push aside the thousands of theological tomes upon it and go back to the original source in all its simplicity and clarity. Then the contradictions between the thousands of obscure volumes and real meaning of life will disappear, and with them the contradictions that apparently exist between the great religions of the world. There is only one truth based on the laws of life and the universe. To reach the heart of the Christian religion, it is therefore necessary to journey back some two thousand years and to try to find the kernel of the great teaching connected with the name of Jesus. We shall find that this message was something very different from what men in the twentieth century imagined it to be. There is thus the confusing duality, the teaching as it was in its original purity, and the teaching as it is interpreted by a contemporary man. If we go back to the original text and examine all the relevant facts, geographical, historical, philological, and exegetical, and we find that Jesus lived and taught certain things. If we leave aside all the theories and hypotheses, we find that these things were very simple, since the greatest things are always simple things. They are as clear and valid today as they were 2,000 years ago, and as they will be 10,000 years hence. Moreover, they work, for they are based on the laws of life and the universe. Put into practice, they can transform our life and give it meaning. They can solve our problems as they solve the problems of those who witnessed the life of Jesus and his disciples. Now what was the essence of the life and teaching of Jesus? Jesus did not write thesis or theological dogma. His teaching was much more dynamic and vital. It was life itself. From the basic gospel text, we see that Jesus always explains the laws of life by means of pictures drawn from nature. Not theories, not hypotheses, but living parables were his tools, and they have the power of convincing us immediately of the truth they convey. His statements require no verification in encyclopedias and learned books. We feel the evidence of his word powerful at once. This is so because they do not deal with abstract thoughts, but express realities, and it is in reality that we live. His words were at one at the same time statements of the verification of those statements. An analysis of Jesus' life shows that his mission had three main aspects. Healing of the sick, teaching of the ignorant, the practice of creative love in daily life. Let us consider these three sides of his life and teaching. The healing work of Jesus is recorded in the Essene Gospel of Peace, a third century Aramaic text existing in the archives of the Library of the Vatican. A much later translation in Old Slavonic was found in the Library of the Habsburgs in Vienna. This text shows clearly that the healing aspect of Jesus' work was a crusade against suffering. Jesus did not teach a complicated system of therapeutics or open a school for the training of surgeons and physicians. He did not wish to make the science of healing the possession of a single class or profession. He went out and healed by the simplest methods in accordance with the laws of nature. The Essene Gospel of Peace gives a simple and clear explanation of the foundation of human health, of the cause of disease, and of the simplest ways of restoring lost health. But his teaching was not theoretical. He went out and cured people by means simple enough for a child to understand. His purpose was not to create a complex scientific system available only to a few, but to show the way by which suffering could be abolished. And besides helping those who did more know how to cure their ailments, he achieved the still more important task of showing them how to live in the future in such a way that they need never be sick again. His methods and his teachings are beautifully described in the Essene Gospel of Peace. 
The second aspect of Jesus' work was his teaching of the ignorant. Here again, Jesus did not create a university or teach in a theoretical way. He did not expect disciples to come to him, but went out and taught everywhere. Just as Socrates taught philosophy in the marketplace and on the street corner in Athens, so did Jesus teach on the mountains or by the lake shore. The canopy of heaven was his church, to which anyone willing to heed his words was free to come. His teaching, like his healing methods, was very simple. He drew attention to the facts existing in nature when he spoke of the wheat, the fig tree, or the fields. Everything he spoke of was a living reality, not to be questioned by his hearers, because they knew it was true. His examples, drawn from nature, simply illustrate and prove the laws of life. It is this natural method which gives to Jesus' teaching its eternal validity and vitality. It will last as long as men live on the earth, because it is based on the laws of nature and the universe, upon foundations which remain the same, whatever the age or civilization. He explained the purpose of life and the role of man in the universe to the ignorant. Though today we have separate teachings from healing, they are in truth one, twin aspects of a single reality. For Jesus, life, health, and teaching were all one. The third aspect of Jesus' mission was his introduction of creative love to man and mankind as a chief law of life through his saying that God is love. This statement is simply the expression of a great cosmic or spiritual law, the expression of a great power which exists in the human body, in which every organ works for the benefit of the whole. There is a unity of the organs. The power we call vitality is simply the expression of love as it is manifested in the human organism. It is that which binds together and sustains the whole body. If mankind would only realize that the human body teaches a great lesson, if the organs did not cooperate harmoniously but began to fight each other, man would fall apart and his life would end. Mankind is also in danger of falling apart through failure of individuals and nations to work together in harmony with the law. Everything in nature and the universe, the movements of planets, stars, and cosmic nebula, proclaims a cooperation or cosmic order which is based on love. Similarly, in chemistry, there is a law of affinity which unites the different elements. This great cosmic law of love is expressed in practical form for men in the Sermon on the Mount, which is mankind's title to nobility. The Sermon on the Mount provides a solution for the problems of man and mankind if the simplicity, purity, and vitality of Jesus' words could be translated into the daily life of each individual. There would be no problems on earth, no wars, no violence, no persecution, no destruction. And in individual lives there would be no nervous breakdown, no conflicts, and we would not be living in an age of neurosis and uncertainty. Let us now see how these aspects of the life and teaching of Jesus are represented today. Let us see if those who stand today for the teachings really accomplish the task as it was laid down by Jesus. We shall unhappily find that the great majority of the churches and their ministers do not in fact heal the sick by the simple and natural methods taught and practiced by Jesus and his disciples. We shall find that those who work in the name of the Gospels do not use sun, water, air, and natural food to relieve suffering mankind from the burden of disease which is everywhere apparent. This aspect of Jesus' mission is at present almost entirely lost. The true principles of health and healing are not followed in the daily life of Christians. They eat saturated fats, white flour, white sugar, and other inferior foods. They drink and they smoke, thus deviating widely from the purity and simplicity of the lives of the disciples and early followers of Jesus. There is an enormous contradiction between the pure, natural surrounding of Jesus and the complex, artificial existence of those who claim to be followers today. There is a great duality. Today, we no longer seek to relieve human suffering by spontaneous acts of healing when we encounter people who are sick. In the Christian civilization of the West, healing has become the exclusive privilege of a professional group which exacts a fee for every ministration. Can we imagine Jesus or his disciples presenting a bill after each act of healing? There is a wide gulf between Jesus' spontaneous reaction to suffering and our own artificial and limited science and profession of healing, which does not take into consideration that the only road toward permanent good health is to replace our wrong eating, living, and thinking habits with the right ones. But the duality and contradiction exist not only in the healing aspect of Jesus' work, but as regard to the teaching of the ignorant. Today, teaching has become a very complicated and abstract thing. Most of what is taught in schools and colleges is nothing but a burden to the memory and does not answer the real requirements of life. 
The schools do not teach us how to live in harmony with the laws of nature. Instead, we acquire a highly compartmentalized knowledge with a complex terminology. Much of the data we absorb has no correlation with the real problem of life. When we graduate from high school or college, our memories are burdened with thousands of items of theoretical, static knowledge. If our lives are based exclusively on this complex mass of learning, we shall meet with failure. Our first task, after completing our formal education, must be to try to forget all the erroneous things we have been taught and learned through life experience, the real laws of nature and of life. Teaching at the present time is not the beautiful, simple thing it was given by Jesus. It is no more given in the mountains or by the lake. It is now based on complex theories and hypotheses, on the classification of an inher incoherent mass of static facts. The present chaotic conditions of mankind shows clearly that our system of education has failed to orient us in life. It has failed in this age of general neurosis to give us happiness. Man today lacks a foundation. He feels intuitively that the present teaching of the churches and of educational institutions is not enough. He feels that they are not the real thing and no longer believes in them. But he does not know what he should substitute for them and simply accepts uncertainty as his portion. He is thus compelled to live from day to day like a fallen leaf driven by the wind or a piece of wreckage tossed by the waves. The old traditions are dead and the new ones are not born yet. There is general disorientation. No longer directing their own lives, people are not conscious of what they want or what their purpose should be. The widespread disorientation shows the failure of present methods and institutions on teaching. There is here another great dualism, our chaotic teaching as against the teaching of Jesus in its original purity and simplicity. Jesus brought happiness to men's life. We with our methods do not and cannot. Let us turn to the third aspect of Jesus' mission, his establishment of creative love as the foundation of life of man and mankind. He established it and proved it with every act of his life. He said, Love one another, and then I shall know that you are my disciples. But he not only taught his truth, he lived it. Today on every hand we see the negation of this principle. We see the deviation from the cosmic law of love. We see very little cooperation, but much competition and struggle. We see much hatred and more hatred than love. We see man set against man and nation against nation. We see Christians, the professed followers of Jesus, in every continent and nation organizing to fight one another. We can only conclude that we have miserably failed to put the precepts of the Sermon on the Mount into practice into our lives. We Christians of the West do not deserve to be characterized as followers of Jesus, as we are followers only in name and not in our lives. We do not exemplify the creative love which was practiced in every moment in the life of Jesus and the first Christians. Indeed, we have followed, failed so grievously that our great technical power at our command is carrying us to our doom. Nuclear energy unmatched by the spiritual power of the Sermon on the Mount spells catastrophe. The technical power we have achieved does not exempt us from the requirements of ethics. If the basic ethical principle of creative love is not at the foundation of human life, if we fail to practice the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount, then we shall perish despite our great scientific and technical knowledge. We shall perish because we have deviated from the great cosmic law of love. In this third aspect of Jesus' mission, there is again a duality. Congregations gather in hundreds of fine churches every Sunday morning to hear a part of the gospel read. Then their members return to their daily life and leave behind them the meaning of the gospel. Real Christianity is not something limited to a Sunday sermon or Sunday congregation. It is a lifetime job. It is not something limited to particular hours, but has to be manifested in every moment of our lives. We have to put our whole life in the service of the great cosmic law of creative love as Jesus and his disciples did. Without forms or creeds, without theological textbooks and dogmas, there is again a duality. In the light of the three aspects of Jesus' mission and what has happened to his messages in our time, we are justified in speaking of two Jesuses, of Jesus as he lived and as he will live forever with the universal validity and vitality of his teaching, and of that Jesus represented by the theological doctrines, by religious organizations and institutions. This second Jesus is the imaginary figure we have created 2,000 years ago after the event. Our task is not to abolish the first Jesus, the real Jesus, who is the greatest gift ever made to mankind, but to try in all humility and understanding to appreciate our total failure to follow him. We have to try to return to the original purity and simplicity of his message, 
to return to the real Jesus who taught the man the way, the truth, and the life, as it was in his time, as it is today, and as it will be as long as human beings live on this planet. For his message to man is based on eternal law, on the totality of the laws of life and the universe. There is no other truth than this which is expressed for us in the beautiful open book of nature, in man's body and mind, in the stars and the cosmos. This truth is based on an eternal intuition. If we deviate from the law, it is not the law which will suffer but ourselves. If only we could understand the present symptoms of universal uncertainty, neurosis, and aimlessness. If we could only realize that their cause is a deviation from the wonderful teaching of the man of Galilee, and that their cure is a return to the original purity and simplicity of his teaching, then the duality of the two Jesuses would disappear, and we would have only one Jesus, the real and the original one, who illustrated in his life the divine inheritance of all mankind. End of chapter end of book. This audio presentation of the Essene Jesus, a reevaluation from the Dead Sea Scrolls by Edmund Berdo Sakelli, has been brought to you by AudioEnlightenment.com. Copyright 2014. All rights reserved.